Uh, the uh, general question that I'd like to uh, address in these two talks is a very ancient one. Uh, what kind of creatures are we? Uh, surely we are very far from a satisfactory answer, uh, but it seems uh, that in some domains at least, uh, particularly with regard to our cognitive nature, uh, there are insights of uh, some uh, interest and significance. Uh, today I'm going to keep to one of these domains, a human language, and what I'll try to do is to show how a careful inquiry into questions about the architecture of language can lead to some quite far-reaching conclusions that are significant in themselves and that uh, differ sharply from uh, uh, what is generally believed, uh, often regarded as fundamental in the relevant disciplines. That's uh, cognitive science in a very broad sense, including linguistics, uh, philosophy of language and mind, actual virtual dogmas in these fields, which I think are unsustainable uh, in the light of uh, a close inquiry into the nature of language. Well, uh, language has been studied intensively and productively for 2,500 years since ancient India, classical Greece. Uh, and uh, throughout these years, there has never been any clear answer to a very simple question, what language is. Uh, I'll mention later some of the major proposals in recent years. Uh, we might ask just how important it is to fill this gap uh, for the study of any aspect of language. The answer should be clear uh, only to the extent that there is an answer to this question. Uh, will it be possible to investigate uh, seriously uh, questions about language and its various aspects? Uh, with regard to its language acquisition, language use, uh, language change, language origin, uh, language in society, uh, diversity in common properties, and the internal mechanisms that implement uh, the system. So for example, no biologist would propose an account of the development or the evolution of the eye without telling us uh, something fairly definite about what an eye is, uh, answering the question, what is an eye? And the same truism holds of inquiries into language. Uh, but there are actually much more fundamental reasons in this case to try to determine clearly what language is, uh, reasons that bear quite directly on the more general question of what kind of creature we are. Uh, Charles Darwin was not the first person to conclude, I'm quoting him, that the lower animals differ from man solely in his almost infinitely larger power of associating together the most diversified sounds and ideas. As I say, he was not the first to draw the conclusion, but he was the first to have expressed this traditional concept within the framework of an incipient account of human evolution. Uh, we now know that uh, Darwin's observation, which I just quoted, uh, has to be qualified in a number of respects. Uh, first, the phrase almost infinite is a traditional phrase that is used to mean what we call literally infinite. There's no such notion as almost infinite. Uh, refer furthermore, reference to sound is uh, too narrow. Commonly, language is spoken, and for simplicity, I'll keep the spoken language. Uh, but it's been learned in recent years that uh, the modality of use doesn't really matter. The sign language of the deaf is fundamentally the same as spoken language in its uh, architecture and its acquisition and use, and even, rather surprisingly, in its internal uh, neural representation. But most important of all, the manner of association of uh, uh, sounds and ideas is apparently quite unique to humans. Uh, not 
no, no counterpart is known in the animal world, which is an important discovery. Uh, uh, a contemporary version of Darwin's observation is given by uh, one of the leading scientists who studies evolution today, <laughs> Ian Tattersall. He uh, published a recent review of the currently available scientific evidence, and uh, he observes, I'll quote him, that it was once believed that the evolutionary record would yield early harbingers of our later selves. The reality, however, is otherwise, for it is becoming increasingly clear that the acquisition of the uniquely modern human sensibility was instead an abrupt and recent event. And the expression of this new sensibility was almost certainly crucially abetted by the invention of what is perhaps the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves, language. And if so, uh, then an answer to the question, what is language, uh, is, uh, matters very greatly to anyone who's concerned with understanding our modern selves. Uh, Tattersall dates the abrupt and sudden event as probably lying somewhere between roughly 50 and 100,000 years ago. The exact dates are unclear and not really relevant to our concerns here, but the abruptness of the emergence is. In evolutionary terms, this is the flick of an eye. It's very fast. Uh, and uh, I'll return to the vast and uh, burgeoning literature about speculation on the topic. It generally adopts a very different stance, mistakenly, I believe. Well, if Tattersall's account is basically accurate, as the uh, limited empirical evidence uh, indicates, then what emerged in this uh, very narrow window was an infinite power of associating the most diversified sounds and ideas, Darwin's words. Uh, that infinite power clearly resides in a finite brain. And the con concept of finite systems with infinite power uh, was well understood uh, for the first time, really, by the mid-20th century. Uh, that made it possible to provide a clear formulation of what I think we should recognize to be the most basic property of language. I'll henceforth simply call it the basic property. Uh, that is, that each language provides an infinite array of hierarchically structured expressions, uh, each of which receives an interpretation uh, in two uh, with, uh, in two, two what are called interfaces, connections, a sensory motor interface for externalization, say speech, and the conceptual interface for mental processes. Now that's the basic principle of language. And uh, uh, spelling that out allows us to give a substantive formulation of Darwin's infinite power or going back much farther uh, to uh, Aristotle's classic dictum that language is sound with meaning. Though there's good reason, I think, I'll return to it, uh, to think that the classic formulation is misleading in important ways. Well, at least then, each language incorporates a computational procedure which satisfies the basic property. Uh, therefore, a theory of language is, by definition, what's called a generative grammar, and each language is internal to an individual. It's a biological property of the person, uh, some subcomponent of mostly the brain, essentially a kind of an organ of the brain and the mind. I take the mind here to be the brain viewed at a certain level of abstraction, it's a practice that goes back to the great figures of the 18th century. Well, in earlier years, the basic property resisted clear formulation. 
So I'll just uh, review some of the cl modern classics. Uh, take Ferdinand de, de Saussure. According to him, language is a storehouse of word images in the minds of members of the community, which exists only by virtue of a contract, sort of contract signed by members of the community. So language is a sociological notion, a finite sociological notion. Uh, for Leonard Bloomfield, great figure of modern American linguistics, uh, language is, as he put it, an array of habits to respond to situations with conventional speech sounds and to respond to these sounds with actions. Uh, he gave a different definition elsewhere find language as the totality of utterances made in a speech community. That's something like an earlier formulation by another great linguist, William Dwight Whitney, uh, who uh, uh, described language as the body of uttered and audible sounds by which in human society thought is principally expressed, thus uh, audible signs for thought. Edwards appear other major linguist of the early 20th century defined language as a purely human and non-instinctive method of communicating ideas, emotions, and desires by means of a system of voluntarily produced symbols. Uh, notice that none of these formulations attempt to capture the basic principle uh, for good reasons. The understanding of what that principle meant was really only reached by the mid-20th century uh, in the formal sciences. Well, with such conceptions as these, it's uh, not unnatural to adopt the principle that languages can differ in arbitrary ways and that each new one must be studied without any preconceptions. And accordingly, linguistic theory consists of procedures, analytic procedures, to reduce a body of data to some organized form, uh, basically uh, procedures of segmentation and classification. That's actually what linguistic theory was say, when I was a student in the 1940s. Uh, much earlier, at the origins of modern science, there were hints at a picture somewhat similar to Darwin's, uh, Galileo wondered, I'm quoting him now, wondered at the sublimity of mind of the person who dreamed of finding means to communicate his deepest thoughts to any other person by the different arrangements of 20 characters upon a page. He's, of course, referring to the alphabet, not to what it represents. He said this is an achievement surpassing all stupendous inventions, even those of a Michelangelo, uh, Raphael or a Titian. Now, the same recognition and the much deeper concern for the creative character of the normal use of language uh, was uh, soon afterwards to become a core element of Cartesian philosophy. In fact, it was uh, the primary criterion for the existence of mind as a second substance within the Cartesian system. And uh, quite reasonably, that led to efforts to devise tests to determine whether another creature has a mind like ours, uh, notably by Descartes' disciple, Giraud de Cordemois. Uh, these tests were somewhat similar to uh, the contemporary uh, Turing test, generally understood uh, as a uh, post-storing to be a test to determine whether machines can think. Uh, you may have read in the Japan Times this morning uh, an article about uh, an effort here to uh, construct a machine that can pass the entry requirements to uh, Tokyo University. Of course, it's not referring to a machine. It's referring to a program that will answer questions, not a very significant achievement, in my opinion. It didn't mention in the article that once the machine enters the university, it's finished. It can't <laughs> learn anything the first year. 
may be true of some students. But, uh, the, uh, uh, however, uh, the Corps de Moise, uh, uh efforts were quite different than Turing's. The Turing test, uh, the Corps de Moise experiments were part of science, normal science. They were kind of like a litmus test for acidity and chemistry an attempt to draw conclusions about the real world, something that really exists. At Turing's test, his imitation game, as he calls it, uh, had no such uh, ambitions as he himself made very clear, though people who use his, uh, some of his results uh, fail to recognize the limitations he insisted on. The article this morning is an example. Uh, there's... Uh, there's no reason to uh, doubt the fundamental Cartesian insight that use of language does have a creative character. It's typically innovative without bounds. It is appropriate to circumstances, uh, but not caused by circumstances. That's quite a crucial distinction. And it can engender thoughts in others, which they recognize they could have expressed uh, the, the same way themselves. Uh, to quote some Cartesian formulations, we may be incited or inclined by circumstances and internal conditions to speak in certain ways, not others, but we are not compelled to do so. Critical difference, not understood, but the case somehow crucial to our nature. Uh, the uh, there are uh, similar conceptions underlie uh, form formulation aphorism by great linguist Wilhelm von Humboldt uh, that uh, language involves infinite use of finite means. More fully, quoting Humboldt, language is quite peculiarly confronted by an unending and truly boundless domain, the essence of all that can be thought. It must therefore make infinite use of finite means and is able to do so through the power which produces the identity of language and thought. Uh, Humboldt thus placed himself in the tradition that goes back to Galileo and others who associated language critically with thought. Uh, he went well beyond by postulating their identity. It's quite a strong claim. Uh, and he did uh, formulate one version of the traditional conception of language as, uh, again, to quote Tattersall, the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves. Well, this phrase, infinite use of finite means, is often quoted, but it's important to bear in mind that uh, we have, though we have made a quite considerable progress in understanding the finite means that make possible the infinite use of language. Uh, nevertheless, that creative infinite use remains pretty much a mystery, despite uh, there are there's significant progress in uh, studying conventions that guide appropriate use. It's a much narrower question. Uh, how deep a mystery is a good is itself a good question. Uh, may be a mystery that's beyond the capacity of humans to comprehend. If true, that won't be the only case, but could very well be true. Uh, I, it's a worth, question worth exploring, but I'll put it aside here. Well, one, about a century ago, another great linguist, Otto Jesperson, carried the tradition further uh, by raising the question, quoting him now, of how the structures of language come into existence in the mind of a speaker on the basis of finite experience, yielding a notion of structure that is definite enough to guide him in framing sentences of his own, of crucially free expressions that are typically new to the speaker and the hearer. That's normal language use. And uh, then the task of the linguist is to discover these mechanisms how they arise in the mind, and to go beyond to unearth what Jesperson called the great principles underlying the grammars of all languages, and by unearthing them, to gain a deeper insight into the innermost 
nature of human language and of human thought, again, associating language with thought specifically. Now, those are ideas that sound much less strange today than they did uh, during the structuralist uh, behavioral science era that came to dominate uh, most of the field in the years that followed, early years of the 20th century, still very dominant. Uh, these uh, marginalized Jesperson's concerns and also the tradition from which they derive, which was almost entirely forgotten, unfortunately. Well, if we revive it and reformulate Jesperson's program, the primary task is to investigate the true nature of the interfaces between language and other aspects of mind and behavior, and the generative procedures that uh, relate them in the various internal languages that are attainable by humans uh, to determine how these arise in the mind, how they're used, uh, the primary concern naturally being free expressions, not repeated formulas. And uh, to go beyond to unearth the shared biological properties uh, that, are, uh, that determine the nature of the languages that are accessible to humans it's a topic of what's called today universal grammar, uh, adapting a traditional term to a modern framework. Uh, that's uh, uh, the modern version of Jesperson's great principles underlying the grammars of all languages, now reframed as a question of the genetic endowment that yields the biologically unique uh, human language capacity. Well, this mid 20th century shift of perspective uh, to generative grammar within the general biological framework uh, opened the way to much more far-reaching inquiry into language itself and also language-related topics. The range of uh, empirical materials that are now available from uh, widely varying languages of the world, languages of the greatest typological variety, that has enormously expanded. Uh, and uh, these languages are now studied at a level of depth uh, that could not have even been imagined uh, 60 years ago, even 20 years ago. The shift also greatly enriched the variety of evidence that's, that bears on the study of each individual language. It includes questions of acquisition, uh, neuroscience, uh, dissociations of language from other capacities, and a great deal more. And also, for each particular language, it includes conclusions from the studies of other languages. So for the study of English, what's discovered about Japanese is directly relevant on the very well-confirmed assumption that the capacity for language relies on shared biological endowment. Uh, none of this evidence was relevant to the study of language as long as it was regarded as just a set of techniques of linguistics was regarded as a set of procedures of analysis of data. Uh, as soon as the earliest efforts were made to construct explicit generative grammars about 60 years ago, many puzzling phenomena were quickly discovered, uh, phenomena which had never really been noticed as long as the basic property was not clearly formulated and addressed, and as long as the uh, syntax structure of <coughs> sentence for formation was just considered a use of words uh, determined by convention and analogy. Uh, this is somewhat reminiscent of the very early stages of modern science since the 17th century. Uh, for millennia, scientists had uh, been satisfied with simple explanations for familiar phenomena. So rocks fall and steam rises because they're seeking their natural place, period. Uh, we perceive uh, objects interact because of what were called sympathies and antipathies. Sympathies draw them together, the antipathies push them apart. Uh, we perceive uh, 
object, say a triangle, because its shape flits through the air and then plants itself in our brains. Uh, uh, other explanations of this sort. When Galileo and his contemporaries allowed themselves to be puzzled about these phenomena, about the phenomena of nature, that's when modern science began. And it was very quickly discovered that many of our beliefs are senseless and uh, our intuitions are completely wrong. Uh, willingness to be puzzled is a very valuable trait to cultivate from childhood, where it's natural, on to uh, later life. Well, one puzzle about language that came to light about 60 years ago and remains alive, and I think is highly significant in its import, has to do with a very simple but curious fact, the universal in language. So consider the simple sentence, uh, instinctively, eagles that fly swim. There's an adverb, instinctively. It's associated with a verb. But notice that the verb that it's associated with is swim, not fly. And you're saying that instinctively eagles swim, not that they fly when you say instinctively eagles that fly swim. Uh, that's a simple but curious fact. Uh, why is that true? The, there is a thought that eagles that instinctively fly swim, fine thought. You just can't express it this way. Uh, and uh, similarly, the question, can eagles that fly swim, is about swimming, not about flying. Well, what's puzzling about all of this is that the association of the adverb, uh, the clause initial element, instinctively or can, its association to the verb is remote and it's based on structural properties, not close and uh, proximal and based solely on linear properties. And uh, that is a puzzling fact, because linear properties are a far simpler computational operation. It's one that would be optimal for processing language, for example. But language doesn't use it. It makes use of a property of minimal structural distance, never using the much simpler operation of minimal linear distance. It's true in this case, numerous other cases, every case known. Ease of processing is simply ignored in the architecture of language. It's a rather crucial fact. In technical terms, the rules are what, is called, are what are called uh, structure dependent. They ignore linear order and proximity. Uh, the puzzle is why this should be so, uh, not just for English, but for every language, and not just for these constructions, but for every construction known. Well, there is a simple explanation uh, for the fact that a child reflexively, without instruction, knows the right answer in cases like these, uh, even though evidence is slight or, in fact, non-existent. The explanation is that linear order is simply not available to the language learner uh, who, who's confronted with uh, such examples. The language learner is guided by a deep principle of universal grammar that restricts search to minimal structural distance. It bars the much simpler computational operation of minimal uh, linear distance. Now, this, is, uh, this proposal, of course, at once calls for further explanation. Why should it be so? What is, the, what is it about the genetically determined character of language that imposes this particular puzzling condition? Uh, the general principle of minimal distance is extensively employed in language design. It's presumably a case of a more general principle principle of minimal computation, uh, which itself is probably just a property of uh, general property of the natural world, organic nature at least, even beyond. But there must be some special property of language design that restricts minimal computation to structural rather than linear distance. It avoids uh, the much simpler uh, 
procedure of uh, linear computation uh, and uh, processing, simpler but ignored universally. Well, there is, uh, in this case, independent evidence uh, from other sources, including the neurosciences, uh, which supports the same conclusion. Uh, there's a research group in uh, Milan, uh, the linguist working there, many of you know, Andrea Moro, uh, they uh, studied brain activity of subjects who were presented with two kinds of stimuli. Uh, they were confronted with invented languages that satisfy universal grammar and other invented languages that uh, uh, reject principles of universal grammar. Uh, in the latter case, for example, a rule for negation of sentences uh, that places the negative element after the third wor word. Very simple rule, but there's nothing like it in natural language, which doesn't count words. Uh, they found something quite interesting. They found that in the cases of invented languages that conform to universal grammar, uh, there's normal activation in the language areas of the brain. Uh, but when you use linear order, though it's much simpler, uh, that's not the case. There's just general activation uh, outside the language areas, which means essentially that people are treating it as a puzzle, a non-linguistic puzzle. Uh, there's actually uh, quite interesting results by uh, uh, two linguists, Neil Smith and Yanthi Maria. Simply, they've studied a cognitively impaired subject in fact, has very little cognitive capacity, but has remarkable capacity to acquire languages. Uh, and their study with him revealed similar conclusions. They found that uh, uh, he was, uh, this subject was able to deal with invented languages that conform to linguistic principles, but he couldn't deal with the puzzles at all. They were impossible for him. Uh, there was a kind of an interesting counterpart with normals. Uh, they were able to deal with the systems that violated linguistic principles if it was presented to them just as a puzzle. But if it was presented to them as a language, they couldn't do it uh, if uh, they were the same as the cognitively impaired person. So somehow the framework of looking at a language imposed the principles of universal grammar and made it impossible for them to understand a very simple system uh, that violated these principles by using linear order. Well, there's a, there's a broader thesis, uh, and that is that linear order of words is never available for computation in the core parts of language that involve uh, syntax and semantics. Uh, if that's the case, then linear order is just a peripheral part of language, something secondary, ancillary. It's kind of a reflex of properties of the sensory motor system, which requires it. We can't speak in parallel. Uh, we can't produce structures. We can only produce strings of symbols. So whatever's going on in the mind has to sort of be filtered through the sensory motor apparatus, which is not specifically adapted to language. Uh, the parts that are relevant for language, which were in place uh, hundreds of thousands of years before language emerged. Uh, there's also evidence that uh, the auditory system of uh, chimpanzees uh, is uh, quite, is pretty much the same as our own, and in fact well adapted for human speech. They even pick out the same distinctive features, phonological features. But uh, apes, it can't even take the first step in language acquisition. First step that every infant takes reflexively immediately on birth is somehow to extract from the complex environment linguistically relevant data. That's almost a miraculous achievement. Nobody knows how it's done. An infant's just presented with a lot of noise and somehow instantly picks out the part that are language relevant. Chimpanzee hears the same things, but it's just noise. Uh, infants, of course, do it reflexively. That's not a slight achievement and not understood.
there's considerable evidence that the broader thesis, namely linear order is just never available for language, for the core parts of language, syntax and semantics, there's considerable evidence that this is correct. Uh, it means that fundamental language design, the fundamental architecture of language, ignores order and, in fact, other external arrangements and uh, uh, looks solely at uh, hierarchy. That's true of syntax, true of semantics. It doesn't matter what the order and arrangements are. Uh, that's, uh, and if that's the case, as seems to be true, then the basic property is not exactly the way I formulated it and as it's formulated in recent literature. Or rather, the basic property is generation of an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions that connect to the conceptual interface. They provide a kind of language of thought, as it's sometimes called, uh, and quite possibly the only such language of thought. It's an interesting question I won't go into. Well, if this uh, line of reasoning is essentially correct, then there is good reason to return to a traditional conception of language as an instrument of thought and to revise Aristotle's dictum accordingly. Uh, language is not sound with meaning, but meaning with sound or some other form of externalization. Typically sound, though other modalities are also possible, as I mentioned bef before. Well, if so, then externalization is a secondary process, an ancillary process. Its properties are uh, largely a reflex of the independent sensory motor system. And further investigation supports this conclusion. Uh, it follows that processing is a superficial and peripheral aspect of language, not a core property. And particular uses of uh, language that depend on externalization, among them communication, are even more peripheral. Now, that's uh, contrary to virtual dogma uh, that has no serious support, but is dogma in philosophy of language, cognitive science, most of linguistics, and has been for years. Uh, it would also follow that the extensive speculation about language evolution in recent years is on the wrong track to begin with. It almost invariably uh, speculates on how language might have evolved as an instrument of communication. But that seems to be quite a marginal aspect of language, not its uh, core function, as it's sometimes put. Well, these conclusions become even more solidly entrenched if we take a closer look at the basic property. Uh, naturally, we seek the simplest formulation of it. That's just normal scientific method, the theory with the fewest arbitrary stipulations. Notice that each stipulation about the basic property is a barrier to some eventual account of language, uh, of the origin of language. So we naturally want to reduce them. And uh, we simply, we next ask how far we can, uh, what we can achieve with this resort to uh, normal scientific method. Well, the simp there is a simplest computational operation. It's embedded in some manner in every computational procedure. The simplest operation is one that takes two objects that have already been constructed, call them X and Y, and it uh, forms a new object, call it Z. Uh, the name for that operation, let's give it the name merge, it's called. Uh, all of this is subject to the principle of minimal computation. It's probably a general law of nature applies to language too. And that uh, principle dictates that by mer when we merge x and y, neither x nor y is modified. That's minimal computation. And of course, they appear in z unordered. That's again, minimal computation. So merging x and y essentially yields the set containing x and y. It's basically the operation of set formation. Uh, notice that if language conforms to the principle of minimal computation, 
we have quite a far-reaching answer to the puzzle of why linear order is only a secondary property of language, apparently not available for core syntactic semantic uh, operations. Uh, the reason is that language is perfectly designed. If language is perfectly designed, that's the conclusion that follows. And again, we may ask why language should be perfectly designed. Each answer, as always, leads to a further question. So let's keep that one in mind for a moment. Uh, when we look further, uh, evidence mounts in support of this conclusion. I can only give a few examples. Uh, notice that this also uh, yields a, an answer to the question of why rules are structure dependent. They have to be if language is perfectly designed. Well, let's take a look further. Now, suppose that X and Y are merged and neither is part of the other. So it'd be like combining, say, read and that book to form the syntactic object corresponding to read that book. Uh, let's call that external merge. Now, suppose that one of them is part of the other. So if we combine, if we have a sentence, uh, John read which book, and we take which book and merge it with a whole sentence. We get which book John read which book. That actually surfaces uh, through the sensory motor system as which book did John read with further operations that I'll return to. Now, this is an example of a ubiquitous phenomenon in language, phenomenon of displacement. The phrases are heard in one position but interpreted somewhere else. Uh, so the sentence which book did Don, John read is interpreted as which book X is such that John read the book X. You hear it in front, but you interpret it both in front and in the position where X was. Uh, in this case, the result of merge of X and Y is again the set containing X and Y, but it has two copies of the one that's merge, second merge. It's two copies of Y. The one is the original one that remains in X. The other one is the displaced one uh, merged with X. Operation. This operation is called internal merge. If you look at the logic of the situation, external and internal merge are the only possible cases. So this exhausts the possibilities. And both of them come free if you formulate merge in the optimal way, applying to any two objects that have already been constructed, no further conditions. Now, that's an important fact. Uh, for a long time, decades, it was assumed, uh, by me too, in fact, that displacement is a kind of imperfection of language, something that has to be explained away. Why should it exist? Strange property. That turns out to be incorrect. Displacement is what you would expect on the simplest assumptions, on the assumption that language design is perfect. And that's what we find. Uh, another important fact is that merge in this simplest form, uh, satisfying the principle of minimal computation, uh, yields the structures that are appropriate for semantic interpretation, just illustrated in the case of uh, which book did John read. But of course, these are the wrong structures for the sensory motor system. Uh, universally, in languages, only the structurally most prominent element is pronounced. The other copy is not pronounced. Uh, well, this deletion property re, uh, follows from another uh, uncontroversial application of minimal computation. They compute and articulate as little as possible. And the result is that the articulated sentences have gaps, positions where something is understood but not heard. Uh, that's, uh, for the hearer, that's a problem. The hearer has to figure out where the missing element is. Uh, those of you who have studied perception and parsing know that that's no small problem. In fact, it's the major problem. It's called filler gap problems. So in this very broad class of cases, too, uh, the language simply doesn't care about ease of processing, dramatically so. It satisfies minimal computation, yields a language of thought perfectly 
causes problems for perception and processing, but the design of language doesn't care about that. Well, the same conclusions hold in more complex cases. I can't review them here. In all such cases, just like instinctively eagles that fly swim, it's inconceivable that any form of data processing could yield these outcomes. There are huge enterprises in the computational cognitive sciences trying to show that with what's called these days big data, you know, tons and tons of data and statistical processing, you'll somehow miraculously get results. You can prove initially, before you even start the enterprise, that you're never going to find anything for simple reasons like this. Not that that's going to stop the enterprise, I should say. Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind. Uh, it follows that results like these must follow from just the genetic endowment that provides the language capacity, uh, the most elementary computational operation combined with the biological property of uh, minimal computation. Uh, well, in ways like these, we can derive quite uh, far-reaching and very firm conclusions about the nature of universal grammar. One central conclusion is that if language is optimally designed, if it's perfect, it'll provide structures appropriate for semantic interpretation, for determining the meaning, but that yield difficulties for perception and language processing, hence in particular for communication. And in general, there are many cases where ease of processing and communicative efficiency conflict with computational efficiency in language design. And in every known case, uh, a computational efficient, uh, communicative efficiency is sacrificed. It's not considered computational efficiency is what counts. Uh, that's uh, also true of communication and other uses of external uh, uh, externalization, as is quite often the case in the sciences. What you actually observe it gives a very misleading picture of the principles that are underlying it. I'll quote the uh, Nobel laureate uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrin, as he points out, the essential art of science is reduction of complex visibles to simple invisibles. It's important to understand one of the reasons why data processing is never going to work for language or any other scientific domain. Well, all of this raises a further question, one I mentioned before. Why should language be optimally designed or close to that ideal? Now, that question leads us right back to consideration of the origin of language. Actually, if the optimal design thesis fits very well with the very limited evidence we have about the emergence of language. Recall, it's uh, uh, what I quoted from Ian Tattersall, uh, namely it emerged very recently on the evolutionary time scale and very abruptly. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that means that whatever happened must have been some slight change some slight rewiring of the brain, which somehow created the system. There were no selectional pressures, so it would have been perfect. It would have been simply conforming to laws of nature, the kind of the way a snowflake forms uh, in an intricate design, but without any uh, selectional effects. That's just what physics determines. And that probably is true here, too. Probably what, the best guess is that what happened, say, 75,000 years ago in one person, because, of course, mutations take place in a person, uh, what might presumably happen is that some slight rewiring of the brain yielded merge. Naturally, it would be in its simplest form that would provide at once the basis for unbounded and creative thought. That would be what archaeologists sometimes call the great leap forward that's revealed in the archaeological record right around that period uh, with the remarkable differences separating modern humans uh, from their predecessors and from anything else in the animal kingdom. Well, insofar as this surmise is sustain sustainable, 
we would have an answer to the question about apparent optimal design of language. Why should we expect it? Well, because that's what would, would be expected under the circumstances that apparently existed. No selectional or other pressures uh, so that the emerging system should just follow the laws of nature. Uh, in this case, principles of minimal communication. Again, the way a snowflake follows the laws of nature. Well, these remarks only scratch the surface, but uh, I hope they can pique your curiosity and serve to illustrate why the question, what is language, it matters quite a lot. And it also illustrates uh, how a close attention to this fundamental question can yield conclusions that have many ramifications for what kinds of creatures we are. Thanks. I just said that uh, yesterday I uh, approached the question of what kind of creatures we are from an individual perspective, from the perspective of our individual intellectual resources, cognitive capacities. And uh, I focused on what has been called the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves, language, quoting from the most important recent uh, scientific study of uh, the evolution of uh, modern humans. <clears throat> but of course, humans are social beings, and the kind of creatures we become uh, depends crucially on the social, cultural, institutional circumstances of our lives. And we're therefore led to inquire into the social arrangements in which we live and their effects and consequences, and also to reflect on the kinds of social arrangements uh, that would be conducive to the rights and well-being of human beings. Uh, what kind of arrangements would uh, help them fulfill their just aspirations, uh, what's sometimes called the common good? Uh, and uh, we're led to compare these ideals with the reality of the social world in which we live. Uh, a good place to start, I think, is with a classic text, uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, On Liberty. Uh, the epigraph uh, formulates, I'll quote, the grand leading principle towards which every argument unfolded in these pages directly converges the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. Actually, those words are quoted from Wilhelm von Humboldt, who's one of the founders of classical liberalism. Uh, John Stuart Mill, of course, was a uh, leading exponent of it in later years. And he was also one of the founders of the modern university system, the uh, institutions of humanistic uh, higher education. Well, it follows from that assumption that institutions that constrain such human development are illegitimate, should not be tolerated, unless they can somehow justify themselves. Now, that's uh, the core principle of classical liberalism. And it opens the way into productive inquiry, into the nature of the common good, how we might seek to achieve it, and how existing institutions constrain and sometimes undermine it. Well, Humboldt, this epigraph, this quote from Humboldt, is actually a, a rather familiar concept of the, uh, of the Enlightenment. Uh, another illustration is uh, Adam Smith's a very sharp critique of division of labor in his classic work, uh, Wealth of Nations. So to quote Smith, the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. And that being so, the man whose life is spent in performing as few simple operations, of which the effects too are always the same, has no occasion to exert his understanding, and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human being to be. And therefore, in every improved and civilized society, this is the state 
into which the laboring poor, the great body of the people, will necessarily fall unless government takes some pains to, uh, to uh, prevent it. So the task of government in a civilized society is to prevent division of labor. Uh, concern for the common good should therefore impel us to find ways to overcome the impact of these uh, devilish policies uh, from the educational system to the conditions of work, which should throughout provide opportunities and encouragement to exert the understanding to cultivate human development in its richest diversity, core principles of classical liberalism. Well, uh, Adam Smith's very sharp critique of division of labor, which I've just quoted, is virtually unknown, uh, although uh, his words of praise for the great benefits of division of labor are very commonly quoted. You've probably all studied them. Uh, in fact, in the Chicago University scholarly bicentennial edition, uh, the passage I just quoted isn't even listed in the index. Uh, evidently, it cannot be perceived uh, when the text is viewed, this is Wealth of Nations, when the text is viewed through the distorting prism of contemporary doctrine. But it's there, and it's central to Smith's thought, and is an instructive uh, illustration of the Enlightenment ideals that are founding principles of classical liberalism and in fact are very remote from the image that's presented of it in contemporary doctrinal terms. Well, uh, Smith uh, felt that it uh, should not be too difficult to institute such humane policies as these. He has another major work, Moral Sentiments, and he opens it by observing, I'll quote, that however selfish man may be supposed to be, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. And uh, Smith founded his uh, thought on these aspects of human nature. He contrasted them with a different conception what he called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, all for ourselves and nothing for other people. And uh, Smith evidently hoped that the more benign elements of human nature uh, might overcome the pathology of the uh, masters of mankind. Well, today, uh, Adam Smith is the icon of those who uh, preach the vile maxim. Uh, preach the doctrines of uh, what's called possessive individualism with its core image of uh, economic man uh, who pursues the vile maxim. That's the core doctrine of contemporary neoliberalism. Uh, the real Adam Smith was diametrically opposed to these ideas. Uh, these are matters that are quite important to understand if you hope to grasp the uh, doctrines of today's masters of mankind and the social order that they have constructed, uh, what we can call a really existing capitalist democracy. Uh, this is far from the only case where the true Adam Smith has been replaced by an image uh, that suits contemporary doctrinal needs. An even more striking example is the use that's made of his famous phrase, invisible hand. Uh, the phrase actually rarely appears in Adam Smith's work. It does appear once in his classic book, Wealth of Nations. Here's where it appears. Smith considered the possibility that British capitalists would choose to shift their transactions abroad uh, importing, exporting, uh, investing abroad. And he wrote that if, if they did that, they would profit, uh, but England would be harmed. Uh, but however, that is unlikely to happen, Smith argued. The reason is uh, English capitalists would prefer to invest and to purchase in the home country. So as if by an invisible hand, 
England would be spared the ravages of economic liberalism. Uh, in short, uh, Smith is providing an argument against the neoliberal globalization that's currently hailed in his name. Uh, the other leading founder of uh, uh, classical economics, uh, David Ricardo, uh, drew very similar conclusions. Uh, these are facts that are disregarded and, in fact, denied in contemporary ideology. Uh, the phrase invisible hand appears one other time uh, in his other major work, Moral Sentiments. Uh, here Smith argues, I'll quote him, that even the proud and unfeeling landlord will attend to the needs of the poor. So an invisible hand will ensure that nearly the same, will ensure nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all of its inhabitants. Uh, in short, Smith is uh, using the, the concept invisible hand to express his commitment to equality and his hope that our better nature will lead even the brutal masters to pursue the outcome of equality as if by an invisible hand. Naive hope, no doubt, but it's illustrative of the actual ideals of classical liberalism. Now, that exhausts his usage of the phrase invisible hand, radically different from what's claimed today when you hear it used. Well, in the thinking of uh, the real Adam Smith and his eminent successors, like John Stuart Mill, uh, we find two visions of society which are sharply counterposed. The first is actual classical liberalism. It's founded, again, on the grand leading principle of the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. And it regards this ideal as attainable uh, because of our natural instincts of sympathy and solidarity. Now, that's one vision. The contrasting vision calls for the social order to succumb to the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, the principle that humans are driven by calculations of self-interest, that our interactions are governed by selfish competition, the core principle of modern economic theory, and also of the neoliberal doctrines of the masters of mankind. Uh, these contrasting visions are found throughout the culture. Uh, they emerged, for example, uh, uh, almost immediately in the theory of evolution, shortly after Darwin's work. Uh, one conception was developed by the anarchist uh, theorist and activist uh, Peter Kropotkin, who was also a, an accomplished natural historian. Uh, he argued, rather like Smith, that the driving, a driving force in evolution is mutual aid. It's the title of his book. That's Adam Smith's uh, concern uh, for uh, sympathy and concern for the welfare of others. That's one version. The contrasting version was Herbert Spencer's concept of survival of the, physit, of the fittest uh, in a hostile world, a world that is where nature is red in tooth and claw, Wordsworth's phrase. The latter vision is the one that has survived the growth of capitalism. In this respect, as many others, uh, capitalism, modern capitalism, is directly opposed to the thought of its early founders. And the actual thought is found uh, somewhere else in the uh, libertarian, left libertarian thought and action core component of the modern anarchist tradition. It's the true inheritors of classical liberalism. Again, exactly contrary to what's claimed. Uh, these contrasting visions uh, also emerged in the, uh, quite a, at once in popular culture as industrial capitalism uh, began to have its uh, revolutionary social impact. In the United States, uh, that took place in eastern New England, mid-19th century, 
the new industrial capitalist system was, of course, based on the vile maxim. And it was bitterly condemned by working people who were driven by need into uh, the mills, uh, Irish artisans from Boston, uh, uh, young women from the farms, others like them. Uh, they had a lively press of their own. It's the period of the greatest free press in the United States, maybe anywhere. Uh, the, in their press, they condemned what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self. The vile maxim extended to everyone. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the doctrine of uh, selfish competition uh, that underlies uh, contemporary neoliberal doctrine. So I'll quote their own words in the independent labor press. The industrial system demanded that working people be the humble subjects of a foreign despot, the absentee owners, slaves in the strictest sense of the word, who toil for their masters. Uh, working people demanded that those who work in the mills should own them, as incidentally did uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, they strongly opposed the wage system. Uh, as they put it, when the free producer sold his product for a price, he retained his person. But when he had to sell his labor for a wage, he sold himself. He lost his dignity as a person as he became a slave, a wage slave, which was the term commonly used. Uh, and notice I'm not quoting from the Marxist tradition. I'm quoting from the core of the working class as it emerged in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they regarded wage labor to be barely different from slavery, chattel slavery. Uh, the only difference was that wage labor was supposedly temporary. Uh, that view was so common that it was a slogan of the Republican Party. Uh, Abraham Lincoln upheld it, for example. Uh, it has taken massive effort over the past 150 years to try to drive these ideas out of people's minds, uh, to uh, instill uh, the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self, the concept of economic man, of uh, contemporary ideology guided by the vile maxim. And despite the huge propaganda effort, uh, the commitment to personal dignity and freedom is not far below the surface, and it continually bursts forth, often in unexpected ways. Well, classical liberalism uh, could not survive capitalism. It was wrecked on the shoals of capitalism and is gone. Uh, but its uh, humanistic uh, commitments and aspirations didn't die, and they continue to animate popular struggles for a more just and free and more humane society. Their natural inheritor, as I mentioned, is the left libertarian anarchist tradition with its many manifestations. Uh, the conflict persists to the present. Uh, sometimes the grand leading principles of the Enlightenment and classical liberalism are carried forward. Sometimes there's regression uh, with the vile maxim in the ascendant. Uh, we happen to be living now in one of those periods of regression, past generation roughly. This is the period of the, the neoliberal assault on the global population, past generation, a period when the vile maxim uh, not only reigns but is exalted in doctrine as uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, famously declared, there is no alternative. We must succumb to the vile maxim. Uh, the neoliberal assault takes many forms, but there are common features. Uh, I'll just consider the United States the most important case. It's the richest, most powerful country in world history. 
primary home of the modern doctrine, sometimes called the Washington Consensus, uh, when it's uh, imposed on uh, the poorer, more vulnerable societies. And the United States uh, provides quite rich insights into the vile maxim that is exalted in contemporary ideology. So take a look at the United States today. There are tens of millions of people who are eager to work but have no jobs. And many have simply dropped out of the workforce in despair. The official unemployment figures are highly misleading because they don't count people who have just given up, huge numbers of them. Uh, there are ample resources to provide employment, but they're hidden away. They're hidden where they cannot be accessed in the overflowing pockets of the uh, super rich and the corporate sector, uh, particularly the big banks, uh, which have been very generously rewarded for having created a crisis uh, severe enough to have uh, almost brought down the domestic and global economy. And there are vast amounts of work to be done. Uh, the infrastructure is collapsing. Uh, schools badly need repair and teachers. Uh, the transportation and energy systems uh, have to be radically reconstructed, and a great deal more, uh, ranging from the construction to scientific research. So, but uh, neoliberal capitalism, really existing capitalism, is so dysfunctional that it cannot put eager hands to needed work using the resources that would be readily available if the economy were designed to serve human needs rather than wealth beyond the dreams of avarice for a privileged few. It's pretty hard to think of a more severe indictment of a socioeconomic system. Uh, this uh, dysfunctional economy has been accompanied by very high concentration of wealth, historically almost unprecedented. And uh, concentrated wealth translates immediately to political power that yields legislation that drives the cycle forward, creates an even more dysfunctional social order. Uh, inequality in the United States has reached historic heights. Uh, in the past decade, 95% of growth uh, has gone to 1% of the population, actually mostly to a small fraction of these. Uh, meanwhile, the general population has faced stagnation or decline. Uh, median real income in the United States is actually below its level 25 years ago. Uh, for males, uh, median real income is below what it was in 1968. That's the neoliberal period. Uh, the labor share of output has fallen to its lowest level since World War II. Uh, poorer sectors have suffered severely. Uh, among the developed societies of uh, the OECD, you know, the rich developed societies, 40 of them, among these societies, the United States has the highest poverty rate apart from Turkey. And that's perhaps not too surprising because it also ranks near the bottom in social justice uh, for uh, this is during the neoliberal period. Uh, for African Americans, uh, household wealth has virtually disappeared. They have almost no wealth. Uh, that's happened during the latest crisis. Uh, there is a grim legacy of slavery. It's never been overcome. Uh, some amelioration. And for the rest, the situation is not much better than that. Uh, roughly three-quarters of Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck, little or no emergency savings. That's the richest, most powerful society in world history with incomparable advantages, but under attack, under the attack of the neoliberal assault on the general population. 
Well, these developments should not be confused with the workings of capitalism or free markets. Uh, quite the contrary. The policies are carefully designed to protect the masters from market discipline. Now, this is, won't just give you one dramatic example, though it's far from the only one. Uh, the most dramatic example is the big banks, uh, during the, which are the dominant force in the economy now. Uh, during the neoliberal period, there's been an enormous expansion of financial institutions and a very radical change in their function. There was a great growth period, 1950s and 1960s. But during that period, banks were banks. And they took deposits from individuals and they lent them to borrowers to do something. Uh, buy a house, uh, send your kids to college, something. Uh, and they were regulated. And since they were regulated, there were no financial crises, none. Uh, during the past generation, all of that has changed. Uh, financial institutions now engage in massive speculation, very complex manipulation of markets and currencies, uh, employing exotic financial instruments that conceal their operations. And regulation has largely been abandoned during the neoliberal period. Uh, that's the doctrine. And there's an immediate and predictable consequence. Regular financial crises for the past 30 years, beginning with Reagan and on to the present, each one more severe than the last. Uh, meanwhile, the financial institutions have grown enormously in scale. Uh, they reached about 40% of corporate profits uh, right before the latest, most severe of the crises for which they are responsible, the 2008 crisis. Well, there has been economic growth through the neoliberal period, not at the earlier pace, but it continues. It is, however, largely artificial. It's sustained by repeated bubbles, uh, the savings and loan bubble under Reagan, uh, the technology bubble under Clinton, the housing bubble under Bush. It's the one we're now suffering from. When the last of these burst, of course, they always burst. Uh, when the last of them burst, it created a financial crisis that had severe consequences for the entire global economy. And it, meanwhile, near depression conditions persist for uh, much of the domestic population. The costs of the latest financial crisis, the one that began in 2008, are estimated at 24, 24 trillion dollars of lost output. That's by the Congressional Budget Office. Well, it's calamitous for the population, which bears the costs, uh, but the practices of the financial sector have been highly profitable for themselves. Uh, each crisis is largely caused by Wall Street practices, often crimes, but the culprits are regularly rescued by the taxpayer, as indeed is true right now. Uh, the primary mechanism for rewarding the agents of the crises is a government insurance policy. The informal name for it is too big to fail. Uh, the guarantee goes far beyond the regular bailouts that you read about. It extends to cheap credit, uh, artificially high credit ratings, many other devices. And the scale is huge. Now, there is a recent study of the International Monetary Fund, which found that virtually the entire profit of the major banks traces back to government insurance, it reaches the level of uh, $83 billion a year, according to calculations in the business press. The result is that those who were responsible for the recent crisis are richer and more powerful than ever. Uh, the government insurance policy, of course, leads to underpricing of risk. They take more risk than they should because they're going to be rewarded anyway, so why not? Uh, and it makes the next crisis more likely. That's not a problem for the masters. They're doing fine. 
They can rely on taxpayers to ensure their wealth and privilege uh, under neoliberal doctrine. Uh, the relation of this to free markets is uh, indescribable. It has nothing to do with them. Well, at, after the most recent crisis, uh, finally, uh, several prominent economists, including Nobel laureates, raised the question of what the, of the general impact of financial institutions and the casino economy, as it's called, of the neoliberal period. And they noted that it hasn't been much studied by economists, which is kind of intriguing since it's the dominant force in the economy. Uh, they suggested that uh, if it were studied, it would be found that they're probably harmful to the economy. Uh, but there are some who go much farther than that. Uh, the most respected uh, financial correspondent in the English-speaking world is uh, Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times. He concludes, I'll quote him, that an out-of-control financial sector is eating out the modern market economy from inside, just as the larva of the spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. Pretty sharp critique. Uh, protecting financial institutions from market disciplines is only one of the ways in which really existing capitalism differs from capitalism. And there are many others. Uh, the entire economic history of the United States reveals very clearly how it works. Uh, the American colonies as soon as they were liberated, were given advice by the greatest uh, English economists of the day, including Adam Smith. Uh, they were advised to, to follow the principles of what is called sound economics. And it's pretty much the prescriptions of, that are given today to the weak and uh, defenseless. Uh, they, they advise... Uh, uh, but they were free and liberated, so they totally rejected the advice. Uh, they did the opposite of what was advised. Uh, they, uh, in the colonies instituted very high tariffs uh, to protect domestic industry from destruction by superior British manufacturers. It's first textiles, later in the century steel, uh, uh, and uh, other industries. That's how the United States became an industrial society. And the same is true of Japan, of course. Uh, the, uh, meanwhile, there was extensive state intervention uh, carried out uh, to carry economic development forward. Uh, but also, uh, some of it was quite extreme, like slavery, for example, was a massive intervention in uh, the market. Uh, conquest of the national territory and uh, destruction of the population, and major state enterprise, uh, but also within the productive system as well. So the American system of manufacturing mass production, which astounded the world in the 19th century, it was largely pioneered uh, within government industries, military industries. Uh, the great uh, pacifist uh, Andrew Carnegie who founded the first billion-dollar corporation, U.S. Steel, uh, he was able to do so thanks to contracts with the U.S. Navy. Uh, advanced technology, uh, radio, and so on, was also developed within the same state system. Uh, by 1945, the United States was so far ahead of all competitors that it was willing to tolerate free trade. Uh, that's the same as England a century earlier, uh, when England had far sur surpassed uh, other economies, also thanks to massive state intervention and violation of market principles. Uh, but as in the case of England, the U.S. was willing to do it only within limits, limits that assured the predominance of uh, U.S. corporate power. And even more than before in the past 50 years or so, uh, the uh, dynamic state sector of the economy has been responsible for the advanced economy. It's true of computers, uh, internet, uh, microelectronics, uh, satellites, uh, 
international trade using uh, containerized shipping developed by the Navy, uh, commercial aircraft, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, just about anything you can think of, uh, just about every aspect of the economy. It's uh, typically the case that the difficult, and innovative, and costly research and development is the task of the state sector. The costs and risks are borne by the population. At some later stage, what has been created is handed over to private enterprise for, uh, for uh, marketing and profit. Uh, all of this is very remote from what a market economy would be. Uh, you may have read in the uh, press uh, yesterday or today that Bill Gates has again reached the top of uh, you know, multi-billionaires in the world. That's a typical case. Uh, Bill Gates did innovative work in marketing, but he was but that was on the basis of decades of research and development in the state sector of uh, computers, software, and so on. And in fact, uh, Gates's profits come from a monopoly, quite contrary to market principles. Microsoft has a, a virtual monopoly of operating systems. Almost all of you use Windows. That's a monopoly, and that's how you get rich, become a billionaire. First get the state, the taxpayer, to do the research and development, then do some innovative marketing, then gain a monop monopoly power, and you're off into the stratosphere. Now, the relation of this to markets is, again, pretty remote. Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the United States is by no means alone in this regard. It is following the path of England before it, and it's also been adopted in one or another way by every developed economy, including Japan. Uh, market discipline is for the weak and the defenseless, and not the masters. Uh, they're powerful enough to protect themselves from market ravages. Uh, there's another victim of the neoliberal assault, that's political democracy. Uh, during this same period, the cost of elections has just skyrocketed. And by now, electoral victory is pretty much bought. Uh, there is good research on this topic in academic uh, political science, and it's established that uh, campaign contributions are a very good predictor of policy choices. If you take a look at how some candidates' campaign is financed, you can pretty well predict what policies uh, that person is going to advocate. And of course, the contributions come overwhelmingly from concentrated private wealth, leads to the obvious conclusions. And by now, about 70% of the population, the lower end of the income scale, is disenfranchised. Now, that is, they're preferences have no influence on policy. They're simply disregarded. Uh, as you move up the scale, influence increases slowly. When you get to the top, uh, you get to the people who essentially design the policy. Uh, and as polls demonstrate, there are vast gaps between public attitudes and policy on the most crucial issues of domestic and international affairs. No time to review it, but it's quite traumatic. Uh, so the system that has taken shape is not democracy, it's a form of plutocracy. Uh, the neoliberal assault has had similar effects elsewhere. So take Europe. Uh, Europe's great contribution to modern civilization has been the social democratic welfare state that developed mainly since the Second World War, it's now under direct attack by the apostles of neoliberalism. They're imposing a policy of austerity under recession, which is extremely harmful to the economy. Uh, even the economists of the International Monetary Fund uh, recognize that. They've been demonstrating that uh, 
this is a policy that is almost certain to uh, uh, harm the economy, but it does have the effect of dismantling welfare state measures, uh, which are unwelcome to the masters of mankind, and they are disappearing. It also undermines functioning democracy, all in accord with neoliberal doctrine. So government policies for the European countries are now pretty much set by bureaucrats in Brussels, what's called the Troika. Uh, the, uh, it consists of the uh, European Commission, which is unelected, the European Central Bank, which is, of course, unelected, and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, one of the major economists uh, studying this uh, mainstream economist, Mark Blythe, he points out that in the Eurozone, his words, the Germans draft the orders, the European Commission, and it doesn't mean the people of Germany, he means the German banks, the Bundesbank, they draft the orders, uh, the European Commission implements it, and the European Central Bank facilitates, assuring that full-blown austerity takes hold with brutal effects on much of the population. Uh, and uh, also on the social order. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, not exactly a radical publication, uh, pointed out that no matter what government is elected, uh, from right to left, they follow the same policies because they're determined in Brussels. Uh, popular engagement in policy has essentially been abandoned. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Greek Prime Minister, Papandreou, proposed a referendum uh, on the policies dictated by the Troika, he was bitterly condemned across the spectrum uh, he was for, for suggesting meekly that maybe the public should have a voice that's inconsistent with modern democracy. Uh, the, uh, the duty of the public is just to endure, survive somehow if you can. While the banks, who were largely responsible for the crisis in Europe, as elsewhere, they're amply compensated for their crimes. Well, these policies in Europe have led to continuing recession, which in fact has lasted even longer than the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, the effects in Europe are even harsher than they are in the United States, where, interestingly, the central bank Federal Reserve has adopted less regressive policies than the European counterparts. It's unusual. Same economist, Mark Blythe, comments that the costs are being paid by those at the lower end of the income distribution. As he puts it, they don't vote much. They don't earn much, if anything. They don't matter in elections. And the top 30% are doing fine under this system of austerity. Uh, after all, someone else is paying the costs. And best of all, it's someone they don't even know. In short, simple class war, quite effective. Uh, the impact of the neoliberal policies has been pretty similar elsewhere, though in fact much more severe. In the 1980s, uh, much of the global south was subjected to uh, the Washington consensus, to IMF structural adjustment programs. Now, these were similar to the neoliberal programs in the rich countries in the U.S. and Europe uh, in that they compel the people at the lower end of the scale to ensure the welfare of the rich. So under structural adjustment, uh, living standards of the poor majority are sacrificed to pay foreign banks uh, for the risky and therefore profitable loans that they have made. It was the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, that was the instrument of carrying out this uh, policy of uh, charity from the poor to the rich. Uh, the, and it's, they know it, the American... Uh, executive director of the IMF, Karen Lissaker, uh, simply described the IMF as the credit community's enforcer. And sometimes the effects are truly catastrophic. Uh, two examples are Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, these 
policies, these programs, they were both subjected to structural adjustment in the 1980s. Uh, they had the usual effect of imposing a harsh burden on the general population. And in doing so, they inflamed ethnic conflicts that had been under control. And by the early 90s, these erupted in horrifying atrocities, uh, but the reigning ideology absolves the West of any responsibility for this. Don't read about it. Uh, the most uh, diligent students of the new orthodoxy in the 1980s were in Latin America, which suffered two decades of stagnation and decline. But in the past, past roughly 15 years, events of uh, really historic significance have taken place in South America, a little bit elsewhere, primarily South America. And for the first time in 500 years uh, since the arrival of the European uh, conquerors, uh, the countries have largely broken free of Western control. In the past century, that's U.S. control. And they've begun to, they've moved towards integration, it's a prerequisite for independence. They've begun to address uh, shocking internal problems in countries that have rich resources but have been ruled by tiny Europeanized elites, often white elites, who enjoy great wealth in a sea of misery. Uh, some of the results are sur surveyed in a, a study that came out a couple of months ago by the United Nations Economic Commission on Latin America. It showed that far-reaching reforms have sharply reduced poverty in Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, some other countries where U.S. influence is slight, uh, meaning the influence of the neoliberal consensus. But poverty has remained abysmal in those who, the countries that have remained under U.S. nomination under the neoliberal assault, like Guatemala and Honduras. Actually, the worst record for Latin America was in Mexico, a relatively wealthy country, where poverty is severe, and a million people were added to the numbers of the poor in 2013, last year covered. Uh, in the past 20 years, Mexico has ranked near the bottom in growth of income per person in Latin America. That's a reversal of rapid growth in Mexico in earlier years. Well, what happened 20 years ago? Now, 20 years ago, Mexico joined NAFTA, the North American, so-called North American Free Trade Agreement. It's now its 20th year. North, in the phrase North American Free Trade Agreement, the only accurate words are North American. It does bring together Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, it certainly was not an agreement, at least if people are part of their country. Uh, they were was generally opposed by the population to the very limited extent that people even knew anything about it. It certainly was not a free trade agreement. Uh, quite the contrary. The core parts of it are highly protectionist, uh, for example, imposing the patent rules of absolutely unprecedented severity to ensure massive profits for pharmaceutical and other industries. In fact, most of the treaty wasn't about trade at all. Uh, it's about a wide range of investor rights. The neoliberal treaty has had the unusual feature of harming working people in all three of the participating countries. That's quite an achievement. And it's greatly hailed in the ideological system for its successes, uh, which are not unreal. Uh, the number of billionaires, for example, is very sharply increased, including Mexico, which now has the second biggest billionaire, Carlos Slim, major crook. Uh, this is quite typical of so-called free trade agreements. And it provides a good reason for them to be negotiated in secret though not entirely in secret. They're not secret from the hundreds of corporate lawyers and lobbyists 
who write the detailed provisions with consequences that you would expect. Now, that's true, for example, of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership that's now being negotiated in secret, except from those who are writing it, namely corporate lawyers and lobbyists. Parts of it actually have been leaked through WikiLeaks, and they confirm the expectations. It's a standard agreement violating free trade, but benefiting the very rich. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate in economics, former chief economist of the World Bank, he points out that the negotiators represent corporate interests, and therefore the likelihood that what emerges from the coming talks will serve ordinary American, Americans' interest is low, the outlook for ordinary citizens in other countries is even bleaker. That would include Japan. Uh, well, let's turn finally to the question that was raised in the title, the prospects for survival under really existing capitalist democracy. Again, very remote from either democracy or classical liberalism or market systems. Uh, markets are limited in these societies, but they do function. They're not non-existent. And there are well-known inherent problems in markets, part of their nature. One of them is that markets, uh, uh, in market systems, you avoid what economists call externalities. So if two parties engage in a transaction, say, you sell me a car, uh, the two parties look after their own interests, but they disregard the effects on others. It's called an externality. Uh, and when the parties are large firms, the neglected impact can be quite substantial. So when a financial firm, say Goldman Sachs, uh, takes a, a risk, makes a risky transaction, uh, they take care to cover their own risk, but they don't consider what's called systemic risk. That is the risk that the whole system may collapse if one of their transactions doesn't work. In fact, we've just witnessed very dramatic illustrations of this. Uh, during the last crisis, a huge insurance company, giant company, AIG, destroyed the economy when it collapsed, or in fact it would have destroyed the economy if the state hadn't ridden to the rescue, as it's supposed to do under really existing capitalism. Uh, however, there's a much more serious case of ignoring externalities. That's destruction of the commons, destruction of the environment. That's an externality, not taken into account in economic transactions. Uh, and uh, informed and uh, rational people uh, can no longer ignore the fact that the drive for short-term profits is leading directly to very severe environmental threats and imminent ones. It's another externality that's ignored. And in this case, there isn't anyone who can bail out the perpetrators or the future generations whose chances of decent survival they're putting at uh, great risk. Uh, the institutional structures of really existing capitalism virtually guarantee disaster. And we see the scenario playing out right before our eyes. For example, in the United States, there's a much exuberance about what's called uh, 100 years of energy independence as we become the Saudi Arabia of the next century, and very likely the final century of uh, human civilization if current policies persist. Uh, one might even take a recent speech of President Obama's to be a kind of a death knell for the human species. He proclaimed with pride to ample applause, I'll read it, that now under my administration, America is producing more oil today than at any time in the last eight years. That's important to know.
Over the last three years, I've directed my administration to open up millions of acres for gas and exploration uh, across 23 different states. We're opening up more than 75% of our potential oil resources offshore. And we've quadrupled the number of operating rigs to a record high. We've added enough new oil and pipeline, gas pipeline, to encircle the earth, and then some. Uh, the corporate sector, of course, is cheering. And in fact, they have announced quite publicly that they're carrying out major propaganda campaigns to try to convince the public that climate change either isn't happening, or if it's happening at all, it has nothing to do with uh, human activity. Reminds me of a story that I just heard two days ago from some of the Fukushima survivors. They're being told in the schools and by the government that radiation doesn't happen. One woman told me that her little girl came back from school and explained that daffodils emit radiation. So there's nothing to worry about from the fact that they're a few miles from Fukushima. That's what the corporate sector is doing in the United States and quite openly. Uh, they are attempting to overcome the excessive rationality of the public. The public continues to be concerned about uh, the threats that scientists overwhelmingly regard as serious, near certain, and very ominous. So to put it bluntly, in the moral calculus of really existing capitalism, a bigger bonus tomorrow outweighs the fate of one's grandchildren. That's the vile maxim in operation. Well, all of that makes perfect sense under prevailing ideology and institutional structure, which is directed towards uh, pursuing the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. I'll return to the title of the talk. Uh, what are the prospects for survival under really existing capitalist democracy? They're not bright. Uh, but the ideals of the Enlightenment are not dead. They never are. And the achievements of those who have struggled for centuries for greater freedom and justice leave a legacy which can be taken up and carried forward. And it better be soon if there's to be any hope for decent survival. And the outcome will tell us eloquently what kind of creatures we are. Thanks.